Welcome, my name is Keith Parsons and today I have Mehmet and Chuck with me and we'll be talking about uh, CBRS and Aruba and uh, some announcements they might want to mention today. So first, can we do a couple of introductions? Uh, Mehmet, you want to introduce yourself and uh, the company you work with? Thanks, Keith. Hi, everyone. I'm Mehmet Yavuz. I'm the co-founder and CTO here at Salona. And uh, my background is in cellular wireless. I was VP of engineer at Qualcomm for more than 15 years, working on the design and development of 3G, 4G, and 5G networks. I was leading the small cells and indoor cellular efforts at Qualcomm Cobra D. Uh, in 2018, I left the sunny San Diego and moved to the Bay Area. I was the CTO at Ruckus for a while. And then uh, at the beginning of 2019, we started Salona. And yeah, I was one of the co-founders and CTO there. So, sounds like a nice background. You have both the cellular side and the Wi-Fi side. Chuck? Thanks for having us. Uh, so I'm Chuck Lukashevsky. Uh, I'm a, a VP of Wireless Strategy at uh, Aruba. We are the uh, networking division of Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Obviously, I'm uh, familiar with uh, a lot of folks probably in the audience, but we're very excited uh, to be able to be here together with Salona today and uh, really talk to you about an exciting new development. Well, before we get to the exciting new development, Chuck, you're not in sunny California right now. That is true, <laughs> I, but I don't know how you have uh, how, how you figured that out. No, no clue whatsoever. <laughs> nice, nice slow, snow falling. Well, glad you could join us from wherever you are. So we have Salona and Aruba here today. Anything you want to perhaps announce for us? Yeah, we have some exciting news. We have some partnership uh, with Aruba. At Salona, we bring the LTE and 5G technology to enterprises, and that really complements Wi-Fi. Right? And what we have been hearing from the end customers is that they need both Wi-Fi and LTE in their environment. And what better way to do this uh, other than a trusted partner like Aruba, who is a leader in the enterprise space. And to be more specific as Salona, we offer a complete end-to-end -end solution for CBRS, LTE, and 5G, including both indoor and outdoor APs, core network management system, and so forth. And unlike the traditional LTE solutions, we have a similar vision with Aruba in terms of ease of deployment, cloud networking solution, integration with role-based policies in an enterprise environment. So we feel great about our partnership with Aruba, and it's a great validation of uh, Salona, honestly. And frankly, with Aruba, we gain a wide market reach, and so we can basically sell more and sell faster. Sounds like a good combination. Chuck, from Aruba's standpoint, why Salona? So, um, so maybe just provide a little more granularity on, on the partnership. So uh, Aruba will be reselling uh, Salona's product portfolio. Uh, they'll be on the Aruba price list. We have been um, monitoring and studying the, you know, the, the private LTE opportunity for, for quite a few years now. Uh, the audience probably doesn't know that actually HPE is uh, a, a very significant provider of uh, core software uh, servers and storage, as well as professional services to uh, uh, operators uh, all over the world. We have a huge presence at Mobile World Congress every year, um, actually right next to the Qualcomm booth, Mehmet and I used to uh, uh, bob back and forth. And our customers, you know, in terms of the why um, Salona and why now, so our, our customers have been asking us you know, increasingly about private LTE over the last, uh, you know, especially the last year as um, the CBRS band uh, initially, you know, was open for GAA operations, and I uh, will talk about the acronyms later. So if those are new to you, um, and then of course the, uh, the 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 PAL auction completed just in the last you know few uh, couple of months, uh, and and so we thought that the time really is ripe for a partnership. Uh, first of all, second, I mean the Salona team, um, you know, uh, a lot of whom are good friends and have worked at Aruba uh, in the past, think very differently than the traditional cellular equipment providers. It's so that, you know, the Salona product is really designed by enterprise networking people for enterprise network architects uh, or, or customers. And so the, just the whole way that it's built is, is really best in class. And it's, it's designed to plug into enterprise architectures uh, in, in a way that uh, is uh, very uh, novel and uh, offers a lot of, of flexibility. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I think finally, uh, you know, in terms of why Aruba, you know we're we're you know uniquely positioned I think to 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 really help partner with Salona 
and bring them to um, you know a lot of the sort of uh, you know medium and larger size customers that you know we've served for many years and that we think are probably the best position to make early investments in CBRS and help prove the market. So there's a partnership, and uh, Solona is still selling Solona gear, and mm-hmm. uh, Aruba will also be selling Solona gear. So as an Aruba reseller. Uh, is this going to just be a new SKU that they could go and, and order like any other I- item? I think that's the vision. Um, initially, uh, you know, because it's new technology, we're, we're, we're probably going to uh, you know, be a little careful about uh, who gets involved in which opportunities, uh, as I'm, I'm sure you can appreciate. Um, but the ultimate vision is that this would be like any other Aruba product uh, available to the channel. One of the unique things about Salona is they don't act like a big cell company. They're, they're not Nokia or or Ericsson, and it's designed to, to integrate well. What kind of parts would you need to add to a, uh, say you had an Aruba infrastructure, switches, routers, you know, yep. racks, APs, POEs, all, all the things that we normally do for wireless. What extra parts would you need to add this Solona layer? So here basically you're seeing the uh, Solona architecture, and it has basically multiple components. But the first question is like, isn't LTE and 5G complicated, right? How do you make it simple to deploy and operate? And we've been really working hard to bring an integrated end-to-end solution that is like a one-stop shop infrastructure and it integrates well with the enterprise. Firstly, you see the Salona radios here, which is a collection of LTE and 5G access points. We provide both indoor and outdoor APs, which are plug and play, and it covers a variety of use cases. Yeah, the solution uh, components are are, are the ones I'm showing here, right? The RAN is the APs, both indoor and outdoor. And then uh, we have the Salona Edge, which basically all the APs connect to the Salona Edge over local enterprise network, and it's a complete software solution. which is essentially a cloud native service play. Right. And the RAM and the Edge and the SIM-activated devices are configured through the cloud-hosted Salon Orchestrator. And this is the brains of the whole network. As the fourth component, we provide the SIMs, uh, which is required for LTE and 5G for the end devices. So our customers can provision the SIMs, the SIMs remotely using the device management services. And at the end of the day, they plug in the APs to call, connect to the local internet, and then they long, download the Salona Edge software, and then they log into the orchestrator and activate the network and mobile devices. So we basically created an overlay network that's up and running in minutes. And this is, this is the part that uh, we were talking about earlier in terms of an uh, overlay solution. Can I just jump in for a second? So, so course, Keith, this yeah. is part one of the answer to your question, actually. Um, so you know, with respect to the, the Salona overlay itself, and I just want to point out that this, you know, one of the things that's so um, exciting about this for us is that it's a complete turnkey package. And this is not the normal scenario in the cellular space today. Deploying a private LTE network from most suppliers is a little bit like building a kit car uh, or maybe a kit airplane. <laughs> um, it's a real do-it-yourself operation with a lot of different components and a lot of duct tape. Um, and so Solona has done a really beautiful and elegant job of you know, sort of doing for private LTE what Aruba did for Wi-Fi. You'll remember we also introduced the overlay concept. The radios are obviously APs, and they have a different name in the cellular world, but we'll, we'll, we'll just call them APs. Is the Edge an actual appliance, or it's a, a cloud-based system? Yeah, the Edge is essentially a software solution, cloud-native software solution. And our customers typically run Edge on their... Uh, environment. Sometimes if a customer really requires an appliance, we can ship them an appliance. But majority of the time, it's cloud native software that just they download and they run it on their VM environment or server environment as they need. And in some cases, it can even run on the cloud as well. Usually they prefer the edge to run close to where their enterprise applications are, because that's one of the benefits of uh, LT and 5G, right? To bring predictable, reliable performance for those applications. Then piggyback, so, so the second part of the answer to your question, so now you're looking at, at effectively two overlay networks side by side, right? Which then leverage a common uh, inter, you know, core infrastructure uh, from, a radio, from a RAN perspective. 
uh, or, or radio access network. If you don't know the RAN uh, term, you're going to you're going to be very familiar with it um, in in uh, from here out. But um, I, I want to just also then emphasize the the, the LAN and the compute bit. So. Um, another aspect of this that that is um, you, know, you know novel, and we'll talk about a little more, I think, uh, in a few minutes. The Salona solution is designed to plug in to an enterprise infrastructure, and it imitates you know other enterprise network devices from a layer two, layer three perspective. And uh, for those in the audience that don't know it, you know cellular devices don't have a 48-bit MAC address. That's an IEEE thing that we see in Ethernet and Wi-Fi it's done differently in the cellular system. So to, to connect those two RANs, uh, those two network types together, and then be able to apply policy in a sophisticated way in the enterprise um, requires uh, some, some real innovation, which, which Solana has done. And then on the router part, I wanna highlight just that, that particular box for a minute. Another aspect of the partnership that I think is, um, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, see is really uh, useful uh, we, you know, we recently announced the acquisition of, of a company called Silver Peak, which is uh, you know, a very significant player in the uh, software-defined WAN uh, business. Private LTE systems will need some amount of wide area connectivity that is um, purpose-built. So for example, if in the neutral host case, I have to connect voice calls to a cellular operator core, that's going to have to be done over uh, some type of VPN. If I think about an enterprise customer with dozens or hundreds or maybe even thousands of sites, that WAN router bit that's so small in this diagram actually starts to get fairly complex. Um, and so again, the, um, the Aruba portfolio is kind of uniquely positioned to combine uh, and unlock the value, or, you know, make, make the Solona solution uh, more de deployable. Mehmet, you want to continue with the, the parts here? I'm gathering yeah. the blue ones are Solona and the... Yeah. Orange exactly. ones are Arubas. Exactly. So uh, you, 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 you see the APs here. You see the uh, Celona Edge that we talked about. And then we have the Cloud Orchestrator, right? That's how all these different pieces come together. And I mean, you, you, you see the symmetry, right, uh, with the Wi-Fi components here. And uh, the key aspects, again, to highlight are the plug and play nature of the APs and the Edge. Uh, the integration of this whole solution to the enterprise backend in terms of the policy management, device management, and uh, also just using existing switches and, and so forth. So that's this really very different than what is out there today, right? If you, if you look at the current cellular solutions, LTE solutions, they are just basically a separate network that is deployed with their own infrastructure, and uh, having no integration with the enterprise, giving no visibility to the IT. So we're really excited uh, in terms of bringing this uh, solution as a complement to Wi-Fi in the enterprise environment. And uh, there's, there's really a bunch of unique features that we bring in. I think we'll talk about those. We can also talk about, you know, uh, what are the technical uh, features that come in with the CBRS and LTE as well. How does CBRS make Wi-Fi better? Adding this new LTE component, if I was a customer, uh, why would I need that? Why don't I just put in more Wi-Fi? So first of all, it's absolutely true that there uh, will be CBRS deployments with uh, single radio uh, end devices, uh, endpoint devices, uh, which we call UEs in the, in the cellular world. Uh, examples of those might be IoT devices, you know, video cameras or sensors, uh, maybe autonomous guided vehicles. Our customers, uh, again, have been talking to us for, for some time about multi-band, multi-radio uh, endpoints, right, that have a band 48 radio, uh, you know, LTE radio, and a Wi-Fi radio, and, and they want to be able to use both in interesting ways, right? So, um, you know, if I think about a rail yard or a, a, you know, a container terminal, right, that's, you know, a couple of square kilometers, I want to be able to have, um, you know, really uh, economical wide area coverage, right, with good speed, good rates and reliability. Um, but I probably don't have a lot of vertical assets, right, with power and backhaul. You know, technology like CBRS is, is really tailor made for that. But maybe when I roll indoors, um, again, maybe, maybe I've got an existing Wi-Fi footprint, so I want to roam from one to the other. The two technologies are very complementary in that respect. And uh, you know there are all kinds of other use cases along that uh, along that vein. But fundamentally, you know, I used this term RAN earlier. Enterprises already have multiple RANs today. You've got Bluetooth, you've got Zigbee, you've got Wi-Fi. 
And so um, it's just an extension of an existing buying trend to add cellular RANs to the enterprise portfolio. Well, we've, we've known that cellular frequencies and the LT uh, technology is way better than Wi-Fi for a lot of situations. But in the past, we haven't been able to, to as Wi-Fi engineers, take advantage of that because you have to deal with all the MNOs, and that's a very complex, both politically and business-wise. So, Mehmet, is there something that Salon is doing to make that easier for a company to integrate and get access to that uh, LT without having to deal with all the big MNOs? Absolutely. I mean, one key ingredient here we have to talk about is the CBRS band. This is what um, earlier Chuck was talking about. This is the Citizens Broadband Radio System. Here, basically, the FCC allows the use of the 150 megahertz spectrum by entities like enterprises. So it is not the traditional license spectrum anymore. It is a new band and LTE and 5G devices work on this band, and you can deploy your own network in this band and utilize those devices as part of your network, mobile devices as part of your network. So that's the key ingredient, and we've been driving this for quite some time. It's been, uh, you know, the discussions have been going on for, I think, almost six years. Uh, as of end of 2019, this band became commercial. So now you have spectrum. You don't need the license spectrum. You have the CBRS spectrum. All you need is a, a solution, as we described here, which integrates with your existing enterprise infrastructure and leverages this spectrum, which is a clean, predictable spectrum in your own premise, in your own enterprise environment, that you can have, uh, at the end of the day, a, a parallel network. And this, this brings a bunch of benefits, as you said, and it complements uh, Wi-Fi, because first of all, it's new spectrum, clean spectrum, uh, up to 150 megahertz of spectrum. And you can put more business critical applications in this band. Uh, we see a lot of use cases uh, that really can leverage uh, this new spectrum with the private LTE and 5G technology. Talk a little bit about the 150 megahertz of spectrum, and we just have PAL auctions. Can you describe what PAL is and GAA and why a enterprise, even if there was a PAL auction in their area, still has access to spectrum? Uh, basically, we said there's 150 megahertz of spectrum, right? And this is kind of uh, divided into two groups. One is the PAL, the priority access layer, and the, uh, that goes up to 70 megahertz. The second part is GAA, General Authorized Access, and it's also uh, referred to as the third tier, and it has at least 80 megahertz and can go higher depending on how much PAL is used. So essentially, I mean, there are some incumbents as well uh, that may use a small fraction of the spectrum in certain locations, but essentially, if you're an enterprise, you have access to 80 megahertz of the GAA. And if the remaining 70 megahertz is not used by the incumbents or the PAL, the uh, recently auctioned uh, second tier, then you can even expand your spectrum usage from 80 up to 150. We've done a lot of analysis based on this PAL auction recently, and our analysis shows that pretty much all the enterprises should have access to 100 to 120 megahertz of spectrum. Uh, out of the 150, because, I mean, there, there are a lot of different aspects here. If, for example, a PAL is not deployed, if, if that license is not used, the enterprise has the rights to use that uh, remaining part of the spectrum. And then many indoor deployments has, uh, gets a lot of isolation from the outdoor deployments and so forth. The, the summary is you have at least 80 megahertz, uh, probably 100 to 120. So basically, those, those enterprises who are afraid, if I get into this and then someone's going to take away my spectrum, they can feel confident that they'll be able to have spectrum for, if they design it properly, no one's going to take it away. Yes, it, it, exactly. And, and uh, you know, so the, the soundbite for what Mehmet was just talking about um, that the, the, the policy folks use is use it or share it. 
And that is a fundamentally new concept in spectrum management. It took a lot of years uh, by a lot of people to get the, the, the FCC to adopt that approach. But what that means is exactly what Mehmet was saying, that the, even if an entity has bought the PAL in a particular county, until and unless they actually deploy equipment in a given location, that spectrum is available for GAA use. And even for the, for the entities that acquired PALS, if you think about, uh, you know, so, so the, the auction generated about $4.6 billion in proceeds, most of which was, uh, uh, was bid by uh, you know, traditional cellular uh, providers as well as some of the cable providers. If you think about where a cellular company puts towers, right, it's near freeways, it's near dense metropolitan areas, there are lots of other spaces in a lot of counties that uh, are not necessarily going to have CBRS coverage from a PAL holder. So Net-net, the analysis that Mehmet is talking about is that we do believe that there's going to be more than adequate spectrum indefinitely to run uh, multiple different types of enterprise use cases. Spectrum is, is really important, right? To have clean spectrum is, is utmost importance. And the way the LTE and 5G technologies are designed is such that even if you have spectrum of 80 megahertz, let's say, right? If all the PAL is taken, you're left with 80 megahertz you still get great performance because the network, the whole technology is designed that way. If you look at operators like Verizon or at and I mean, the whole spectrum they have today is like barely more than 100 megahertz. So in the, in the world of cellular, like 80 or 100 megahertz of spectrum is a lot of spectrum because it's designed to be efficient uh, to use the spectrum and then you can get self-splitting and always densify the network. So just wanted to put that in the context uh, yeah, in the cellular space. I think that leads to a great segue to the next question, specifically about spectrum. We're used to talking about 20s and 40s and 80s in the, in the Wi-Fi world, and now even maybe 160s. Uh, and then the whole new 6 gig area, we're not even going to touch today. But that 80 that you talked about, why is the technology different? And what are kind of the slices that you're looking for in a CBRS deployment, you're not going to dedicate all 80 like we would in Wi-Fi. Uh, and could you talk that? And then the second part of that question is, what are the differences from an AP standpoint? One of our Wi-Fi APs covers a certain size area. What are the areas that a uh, CBRS AP would cover? To your first question, right? How is 80 megahertz uh, is, is good and what is different there, right? So it is, it's really essentially the OFDMA technology that has been uh, in place with LTE more than a decade now, where, you know, essentially the infrastructure, uh, the APs kind of work in, in coherence, uh, they are time synchronized, and the data exchange is kind of uh, well coordinated. And each mobile device, each end device, gets a certain fraction of this spectrum during a Operation. So it's not the CSMA or uh, generally TDM kind of approach. It's, it's really OFDMA type of approach. And uh, that, that gives you uh, that flexibility in terms of whichever device needs uh, some uh, throughput at every time instance, every one millisecond kind of time instance, the scheduler keeps scheduling packet and you can have many users simultaneously be scheduled on the downlink and the uplink. And uh, also the other fact is uh, the interference uh, concept is different uh, in terms of multiple APs can simultaneously transmit data and they can simultaneously receive data. So it's different in that regard. And as you densify the network, you get additional, uh, you know, cell splitting type capacity. So you can, at the end of the day, it all goes back to how predictable and uh, how deterministic the QoS is. And that's, that's the key benefit that uh, cellular brings. But in terms of peak rates, right, in terms of what peak rate you achieve, there is, there is always some difference you will see, right? The, the more spectrum, the, the higher peak rates you can get. But the predictability part is, is uh, always there uh, with the LTE and the capacity can come with the densification. Do you want to talk about the differences in in how you would deploy a Wi-Fi AP versus a CBRS AP. Yeah, so maybe a little bit about the coverage areas. And, and you know, we're still working uh, some of this out. Obviously, the, the band just got open, right? So, so uh, you know, a good part of the next, you know, uh, 
four quarters is going to be uh, getting out and actually doing field trials at uh, at real customers and understanding how the propagation varies in, in different types of, of facilities. But as a general sort of planning rule of thumb, you know, we, we say that one CBRS AP uh, is is good for about, uh, you know, the same area that four Wi-Fi APs would cover. So say 10,000 square feet, you know, or 1,000 square meters uh, as compared with, you know, 2,500 square feet or, or 250 square meters in an indoor setting. Outdoors, it's actually a completely different ball game. Pound for pound, if you limited yourself to what a Wi-Fi radio can transmit at, a CBRS radio is probably capable of doing, you know, half a million square feet or, or more. But um, the, the rules actually permit uh, radically higher power uh, uh, levels for outdoor uh, CBRS access points uh, up to, uh, I think it's 47 uh, DBM uh, EIRP. Just on that basis alone, we can cover even even larger areas. And so that's what I'm saying. It, you know, for, for folks in the audience that do outdoor deployments or cover very large areas and are, are used to um, you know, the challenges in trying to find those vertical assets, uh, this is this is really kind of a unique uh, capability. Like this outdoor 47 dBm 50 watts EARP is per 10 megahertz, right? As you get to like 40 or 80, like that also goes up. And it can cover a uh, really few million square feet kind of area. It depends on the specific environment where it is deployed. And the indoor is limited to uh, 1 watt, uh, 30 dBm EARP. And uh, that's, those are the two categories as defined by CBRS as CBS devices. What are some use cases both of you see that, you, that you're heading out for first? The first type of uh, deployment you're looking to, to tackle here? Yeah, if you think about public venues, we just don't have enough spectrum, period, right? So, you know, so more megahertz is good. <laughs> um, Always good, yeah. Data consumption is only continuing to, exp- you know, to grow exponentially, right? There are customers in the, in the public venue space, you know, for example, either all of, the, all of the unlicensed spectrum available to Wi-Fi, right? And so that maybe they want to move the back of house applications off of Wi-Fi, um, primarily to free it up for, for, uh, for guests uh, or fans or what have you. Uh, a related uh, scenario is, you know, we have customers that, you know, maybe are dealing with challenged uh, spectrum conditions. Mm-hmm. And a great example, you know, uh, maybe some of the audience have done this, right? If you if you walk into an electronics retailer today, fire up a, a, a multi-channel packet capture, it's a pretty terrifying uh, PCAP to look at uh, because of the hundreds or thousands of devices that are, um, you know, sending management traffic across the entire bands. If you're the retailer and you're trying to do point of sale applications, for example, um, it, it can actually be really hard to do that uh, in that type of environment. So, you know, we see customers with that kind of kind of need. And then, uh, of course, you know, we've, we've already talked about the, the range benefits, particularly in the, in the outdoor scenario. So being able to cost effectively uh, target coverage to different areas based on the cost profile. Uh, Mehmet, any, any targets that you're starting to go after now? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, verticals that we see uh, really interesting uh, applications and we see a lot of interest in, in those verticals for the CBRS LTE. And it really goes back to those uh, key aspects that Chuck outlined. I mean, the first one is really the ability to deploy a separate wireless network that operates on a clean spectrum and for business critical uh, applications for uh, these specific devices that they have interest uh, on guaranteed performance, it becomes a great solution. So some examples of that is maybe healthcare uh, or retail where we see the um, voice communication devices or even some uh, point of sales devices being put into a network like this. Also, the outdoor coverage, a lot of examples of that. A few ones to highlight are maybe uh, education use cases, higher ed, college campuses. We see a lot of uh, campus safety or emergency response applications, putting lots of um, IP cameras in the campus and also to provide coverage for the campus police or the facilities for their handheld devices. And uh, also connecting a lot of IoT devices in the general campus area. Uh, Also in manufacturing warehouse environments, there's uh, mission critical use cases with uh, dedicated devices on this network with a guaranteed SLA becomes very important. 
And I would like to tell you about uh, what we do, how we create these uh, different slices for different applications to ensure end-to-end -end guaranteed uh, SLAs for those devices. I have an iPhone 11, got an iPhone 12 coming. Are there, you know, what are, what are the devices that support CBRS today? And how would someone in the audience, you know, pull out their phone and say, this is CBRS capable? On our website, we, we keep track of all these devices. I think in our labs, um, JR has done uh, tests more, with more than 40 devices already. So pretty much this, this band is a mainstream band now. And going forward uh, in all the devices, you will be seeing this, uh, this band supported. But very specifically today, uh, on a lot of smartphones uh, from the iPhones to Samsung Galaxies and the LGs and the uh, Google Pixel and so forth, they all support the band. But there's also a lot of uh, gateways and uh, bridges and uh, IoT uh, gateways, as they call it, that connects uh, various end devices to this network. So if you have an IP camera that you want to connect to this network, you don't need the IP camera to have the CBRS support, right? All you need is the Ethernet connectivity, and you can connect it to an Ethernet bridge or an IoT gateway. And uh, so there is a very healthy ecosystem of the gateways slash uh, routers slash uh, bridges out there as well. Do I need a physical SIM or an eSIM or a dual SIM device? Just to, to clarify on what devices use that extra SIM. Yeah, SIM goes to all devices, right? That's part of the end-to-end -end, uh, security and device space security in the uh, LTE technology. So we provide the uh, SIM for the end devices. So today, as commercial solution, we provide physical SIMs. And uh, in the coming uh, few months, really uh, just in the early 2021, we'll be supporting uh, eSIM as well. And again, the key aspect here is all this SIM uh, Technology is, is crucial, but you want to make it easy to operate and manage, right? So it's part of our uh, solution, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, device activation and tying it to the uh, policy management uh, of the enterprise is all done through the orchestrator. So it's, it's really a very streamlined way of operation. Today, you, can, you need to put a physical SIM card. In a few months, you won't even need to do that. You can remotely provision the devices. And it's, it's very similar to uh, MDM kind of uh, device management that the enterprise IT is, is using today. Sorry, just to quantify the devices, uh, just to, sorry for the go back, but um, uh, so I, I just, I, I heard a presentation by the president of the CBRS Alliance. I said, I, I think as of last month, there were over 105 uh, certified devices on the market, and that's up from, I think, maybe just a, a handful, uh, you know, uh, less than a year ago. So it's 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 their devices coming on the market every single month. Good trajectory, yeah. Yeah. So this is the uh, micro slicing feature I wanted to talk to you about a little bit because we talked about the predictable performance, uh, ensuring uh, SLAs are met, and this is this is exactly how we do it, right? I'm I'm very excited about this. So. This is a feature where we provide this end-to-end -end QS for all the different applications running in a network. So our customers can enforce strict SLAs uh, for these applications running on different devices. So on the radio, you have specific uh, QS scheduler that uh, you know, ensures those uh, quality of service. And on the edge, we have uh, the ability to dedicate network resources for different uh, slices. And then you have the KPI level monitoring on the orchestrator. So if, like for folks who are uh, maybe familiar with the 5G network slicing concept, what we have here is a very granular approach to that network slicing. That's why we call it micro slicing. And each individual app on a specific device or device group can be assigned to guaranteed SLAs in terms of latency, packet error rate and throughput. For example, you can have IP cameras with a guaranteed bandwidth of maybe five megabits per second on the uplink. You can have automated guided vehicles with a guaranteed end-to-end -end latency of 30 milliseconds. And 
uh, we, we basically make all of this operation uh, really easy from the enterprise perspective. Does this dynamically, yeah. this is kind of a two-part question. One is, is it dynamically changing the amount of spectrum each device pulls from the available spectrum? And how does it then ride on top of the layer two, layer three network and use the QoS we already have in the enterprise? Yeah, great, great question. The first part, in terms of how much spectrum is used, it's really part of the radio access network, right? It's part of the AP where it does the scheduling of the resources at every uh, time, is a time slot. So every one millisecond, the scheduler looks at all the uh, resource plugs. So think about it as frequency tones. And depending on the channel condition of a certain device, based on the channel quality report, and based on how much data needs to be transmitted, based on the priority and the SLA requirements, the scheduler decides which device to, which set of devices to schedule, right? That happens both on the downlink and uplink. So that's the QS scheduler part, and it happens dynamically every millisecond. So that, that's the first part. And the second part, Keith, was... Um, uh, going the, across the in infrastructure, the QoS that we already have yeah. on layer two and layer three. Yeah. So how we define these slices is, it's, it's really where we stitch the two worlds together. So we have, as the uh, packets come into the LTE 5G network, we need to tag these packets. So we, for that purpose, we can use the uh, DHCP markings, or we can use the uh, you know, five tuples in terms of the destination IP and port and source IP and port. So this is how we identify these different application flows, and then we basically attach it to the specific QS flows within the LTE and 5G. Notice one thing that Chuck mentioned earlier, this kind of framework has the ability to expand to WAN as well, right? So if you have certain DSCP markings on the WAN side uh, with the SD-WAN, you can also stitch this whole thing together outside the enterprise on the backhaul part as well. So, so Keith, let me, let me um, uh, offer a couple of thoughts here as well. Let me back up to the previous question. Most most folks in the audience are, are obviously deeply familiar with WMM and, and Wi-Fi quas. In Wi-Fi, the you know there are four cues, right? Uh, voice, video, best effort, and background. You know, to the extent that people do mark those. So let's say I'm running a, a voice app. You know, there's a lot of plumbing that has to do to sort of make that happen from end to end, which you were you were alluding to. But um, other than marking that category you kind of trust the infrastructure to do the best job it can. And ultimately it's, it's unlicensed spectrum, right? So the scheduler in the access point is doing the best job it can, but it's not solving for any particular target. So what's different here is uh, LTE has, uh, I think it's 16 different QoS levels and they have very specific budgets for packet delay, right? So 50 millisecond, 100 millisecond, what have you on up to you know, several hundred milliseconds. And then, uh, you know, how much, what's the packet drop uh, or you know, uh, error rate that's allowed and so on. So it's a much more granular um, uh, ability to control it. And the schedulers uh, you know, are, are effectively scored on the ability to hit these KPIs. So when, when Mehmet's talking about KPIs, that's, there are numerical targets. So you can think of it as an upgrade to the, you know, the, the quads that we've enjoyed for some time in, in Wi-Fi, which you know, works you know, very well, but you know, in a healthcare environment, in an AGV scenario and so on, um, you could completely understand a network architect wanting to, you know, feeling more comfortable with, you know, numbers, right? That, that uh, and I say, I want, I want this QCI class specifically. Um, with respect to the, um, then the network integration part. So again, I want to highlight, um, you know, we kind of talked about it earlier, but again, um, something that really differentiates the, uh, you know, the Salona solution here is how it integrates with the, the enterprise network. The, the state of the art in um, uh, uh, egress is is pretty primitive of uh, you know uh, you know in terms of what folks in the audience are, are used to dealing with um, you know most most private LTE solutions are doing a uh, very simple sort of either DNS redirection or uh, you know uh, or, or just simple source natting and um, you know there's no guarantee that there's even marking at all of, that's available uh, that tends to be fairly uh, you know the software at, on egress is, is not terribly sophisticated. Uh, and then, of course, if it's, uh, you know, there's no guarantee that you can then plumb that the rest of the way for the different slices. 
So what, by contrast, what Salona has done is, is effectively be able to provide for role-based access control at the point of interface, the, the border between the CBRS network and the enterprise network, such that we can actually apply the same enterprise policy we do in the core, right, and in the forwarding elements to that traffic. So it makes the plumbing for the end-to-end -end QoS a lot more straightforward. Um, and it delivers what effectively are 5G features in a 4G context. What's neutral host? That's a term I've heard. And how, how does uh, Solana play in that Wi-Fi calling across a neutral host capability? Yeah, yeah, great question. So neutral host is the ability of these private uh, LT slash 5G networks to provide service to operator devices, right? So think about a, a retail uh, big box uh, store, right? As the customers walk in with their operator provided devices to provide service to those devices beyond the enterprise devices. So the neutral host aspect is such that you can have one network, which is your private LTE network, that can also serve devices from multiple operators uh, as the same infrastructure. So it's kind of neutral to different operators. And uh, so the, the benefit of uh, the CBRS LTE, of course, is, is a cellular native technology, right? The waveform, the, uh, the identifiers, all of those things are the things that are understood by the end devices, mobile devices. As somebody walks into that big box retail store, it's the same cellular technology that smartphone uses. So, uh, what, what we provide is on the back end, the capability to connect to the operator networks uh, from this uh, CBS LTE network to enable uh, that kind of interface with the operator. And that has uh, a few different flavors. Uh, we support uh, these different ways of doing it. So as an end-to-end solution, we have the complete solution, I would say, to interface with the operators. Now, I also uh, like to say that it, it's essentially a business kind of a, arrangement, right? The operators need to come in uh, and agree with that kind of interface for a specific deployment. So that's kind of where we are right now. So uh, it's, it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis. So it's not like a blanket solution that we can say will work in everywhere in every deployment. It is more of a... Uh, business development going on on that front. But meanwhile, there's an interesting aspect that I also want to highlight. There are devices with dual SIM. So if I'm an enterprise and if I'm providing devices to, to my workforce, now I have the option to give them dual SIM devices. So what can happen is in these dual SIM devices, uh, just examples today like um, iPhone, right? Uh, you can have one SIM, uh, from a uh, mobile network operator, and the second SIM can be the Salona provided SIM uh, for the enterprise network. So as these devices are inside the enterprise facility, they can use the CBS LT network. As they go outside and leave the enterprise, they can fall back to the operator network using the second SIM. So that's a solution available today already with uh, enterprise control devices. Final question, and this is more targeted at our audience of Wi-Fi professionals. This is big news. This is Aruba, Salona getting together a partnership. How, how would a Wi-Fi professional uh, get engaged? Is there classes they need to take? What kind of things do they need to study? How would they want to go about getting involved in this partnership? And Chuck or Mehmet, either of you can answer this. Well, let me, let me start because I'm, I'm a, a Wi-Fi person, as everybody, I think, in the audience is, is you know, well aware. So, um, you know, my, uh, I'll just talk for a second about my journey uh, over the last few years, uh, you know, coming up to speed on, on LTE. Um, it is a very different technology uh, on, from one perspective. But as Mehmet mentions, you know, the underlying air interface is, is very similar, right? And Wi-Fi and the cellular community have been exchanging technologies for, for years and years and years, right? So Wi-Fi, you know, 802.11a, right? Wi-Fi 1 was the first uh, large-scale use of OFDM, right? Which is the basis of OFDMA, which is, right, what LTE uses. Um, 
And of course, Wi-Fi 6, um, you know, adopted OFDMA as a technology. So this, this sort of, um, you know, seeding back and forth has been going on for a long time. So at that level, you know, the, a lot of the concepts, the modulations, if you've studied, you know, if you've got a, uh, if you understand some of the basic um, uh, RF functions that you'd get in a CWNA type of certification, those are going to translate directly. I think where people are going to um, maybe have struggled in, in trying to put together the, the you know, the, the, the kit airplane, if you will, with the duct tape is, uh, you know, having to master all the different system components in a, in a cellular core uh, and, and how those plug into the RAN. And again, you know, what the, 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 the beautiful thing about Salona is the, the way that they've thought about the problem is they basically said, okay, we want to hide all that complexity, right? It's got to, it's got to look and feel like any other kind of enterprise networking equipment, right? There's a radio out one side, there's an ethernet out the other side, right? And all that sophistication in the box, um, you know, really is not that relevant. You don't have to be an expert on it. So I think they've really made it a lot simpler. Um, but um, to help folks along, uh, there's a lot of documentation that's going to be coming available in the next few months. Uh, so Aruba has a whole series of white papers coming out, uh, some very technical, um, that will have bibliographies. Uh, so some of, the, some of the good books that uh, have been helpful to me and, and, and my staff uh, in, in coming up to speed, uh, and then some less technical, kind of more strategy white papers uh, that in turn will build on the, the, the good uh, documentation that Salona is creating. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I have to say, by the way, I've been amazed with uh, Chuck's knowledge about cellular as well, uh, really digging deep into many different aspects. But uh, in terms of um, the, the education part from the, the Salona side is, uh, I would really recommend folks to go to salona.io. We have a lot of material in there uh, from uh, different uh, videos to uh, actual hands-on uh, tests with different devices. And you can always sign up for a product demonstration. And uh, if you want to see this in your own environment, uh, you can request a free trial to get the equipment to test it in your own environment. And you can join our frequency community to learn uh, from the others who are really uh, also testing these different uh, devices in their own environment and share notes and uh, know-how. Those are some great answers. About a year ago, I took the, the CBRS training and course and, and presenting at the mm -hmm. Wi-Fi um, Trek in Nashville said, this is really where we as Wi-Fi professionals, we got this. Um, we need to be on top of this. So if you're currently not up to speed on CBRS, we'll have some items in the show notes, some links you can go to. Hopefully we'll get uh, some of the white papers from the Aruba team. And you can obviously go to the Salona site and learn from there and join their frequency group um, to, to engage a little more. So I'd like to thank Mehmet and Chuck for sharing their time with us today. Uh, and this is big news. I really appreciate you giving me a chance to talk to you about this. Any last words, Chuck? Uh, no, just thanks for the time. And I'd you know, echo uh, Mehmet's uh, call, you know, um, uh, you know, customers that are interested in uh, really looking to see what this can do in your environments, um, you know, contact your Aruba uh, account representative. Uh, and uh, you know, we'd be delighted to work with you to pull that together. Well, thank you so much uh, for this. I think, I think it's, it's really great, very exciting times and looking forward to this partnership and the deployments in the field. Well, thanks for having, uh, letting us have a chance to hear your announcement today. Best of luck to both Salona and Aruba moving forward in this space. Thanks for your time.